Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Week in Horror Front Row, where we sit down with professionals who work in this industry and make this genre the one that we love so very, very much. I have a special guest on the stage with me tonight. I want to welcome, and this is so cool because we never, we never really get to talk to special effects artists and the dudes who work behind the scenes, but this is so awesome. I want to welcome Jesse Lee Chalk to the stage. Thank you so much for joining us for our Front Row. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So uh, I, I think I may have spoiled it a little bit by telling you that that you work in special effects and everything, but that is ever since I was a kid, you know, it's it's a special thing for me because the monsters that that influenced us and the makeup effects going, you know, all the way back to Ray Harryhausen, you know, and the stuff that he did, the Leo, you know, then the, the the greats in there, like Rob like Rob Otten and Tom Savini, and you, you know, you just stand wince all this stuff. But there's it's such a it's such an awesome field to work in. And, you know, the work that you do is just it makes horror what it is. It really does. And given what you do, how did you get in? Like, like what drove you into that? That's. Uh, so growing up in the 80s, um, yes. I mean, you couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't have a more rich just field of of information flowing you know, film was, was huge, you know, going to the theater, the drive-in, you know, we went, I, there was a drive-in right by my house. We went to the drive-in a lot. Um, and I saw the thing, um, I saw all the John Carpenter stuff really, um, was just a huge influence. Star Wars, Star Wars and, and the sci-fi, all of the, in, in the low budget, the, the awesome low budget trash that, that followed, you know, that tried to <laughs> imitate all of those films was amazing you know like the b movie genre was it, it was cool like it wasn't it wasn't um you know it gets a bad rap in some sense but like at the time like those b movies were just rock and roll man they were so much fun and uh you know growing up in that era ghostbusters and gremlins and critters you know i mean i'm, I'm so awesome goes on, on, on. yeah i'm so glad like, that you mentioned that because gremlins was the first film i ever saw at the drive-in back because i grew up in oh, california that's a great, that's yeah, a great so, one for the drive-in saw it in the drive-in and the first yeah. my first theater film my first theater film was was ghostbusters second theater film was et but the first theater film yeah. i ever saw was ghostbusters my, my parents took me to see ghostbusters and gremlins at the drive-in i remember the window the window partially down with the speaker right there on the side oh great great memories that's such a good vibe my, my second cousin took me she was a teenager i was i was younger i was, I was still a kid I, I don't remember how old i was but she told me to see ghostbusters and then she was like i'm gonna teach you something go hide in the bathroom <laughs> and we snuck into gremlins immediately afterward i saw both of those movies on the same day and you know i like i i was so scared we were gonna get thrown out but yes. she got us in she snuck us in both and that was it. That was a cool thing. You could get away with that in the back in the day in the theaters. And, and like, so yeah, she taught me, uh, <laughs> she taught me a cool trick, but, uh, yeah, I saw both of those in the same day and I was like, my mind was blown. Nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just amazing, amazing movies. The whole, that whole era was so full of stuff and, and it's hard like VHS when VHS came out, you know, like to finally to, to just go to the, I mean, it became Blockbuster, but it used to be like these mom and pop places, like every little store would have a rack with movies. And um, and initially they charged an arm and a leg for them, but like you'd go and rent these movies. Um, hmm. And it was just so cool to be able to like pick in, in the, the cover art. You know, that's it's yes. it's just like with with music today, like you don't have the cover art, like, but the cover art was always so cool. And then sometimes the movies suck, but the cover art <laughs> okay. amazing. So yeah. So I gotta ask, so I gotta ask, because you mentioned Carpenter and like my office mm. here at Week in Horror is like a testament to Carpenter. I use my favorite film, my favorite director, you know, my some of my favorite films got Christine, Big Trouble. I got the the uh, the uh the apocalypse trilogy posters over here. Um so huge Carpenter fan. And you mentioned that you got to see uh, the thing in theaters at the drive-in. At the drive-in. At the drive-in. I am yeah. so jealous of you because obviously oh, yeah. my, my my mother would never allow me to go see the thing. I didn't see it until many years later, but Terrifying. I just have to say I'm jealous of that. But um, that that nostalgia that you mentioned there of of the old rental houses, you know, it, I think for all of us. There is when you're looking at those box arts, you don't know what the movies are about, but you're looking at those cover arts. 
there's always one that sticks out to you that you remember even to this day, the one that always caught you. And w- oh, yeah. is there, was there one for you that you always saw and you're like, ah, oh, that, that one right there gets me. Uh, it, the critters stuff. Um, I always love the cover art, you know, I mean, I love creatures. I've always loved. <laughs> so like critters. Um, I remember the, the box art on that one. I, I think the ones there was like, there was so much like after Friday the 13th, like just slews of, of slasher stuff, sleepover, sleepaway camp and like stuff like that, you know, it, and it was, it was everywhere. And like every time you, when you would go in there, there would just be this wall of, of slasher film they were like the lesser versions of the big ones, you know, but um, yeah. there would be tons of, and I remember lots of those. Um, I'm trying to think there was, oh, there was so much and the art was so cool. Uh, I, I love that. And, and I mean, music was like that too. You know, you go to the record store and there, the, the artwork was, oh, yeah. it was so intense. Um, and we've lost that. I mean, you know, we have other things now, but that, that was just a, it was a, it was a different experience. You know, the one that hands. always, the one that always got me was the Evil Dead Two cover oh, that art. That, the, yeah, just the, the, skull. the skull with the eye. Because yeah. it, it was so minimal. It's so minimalistic, and yet, so, when you're at that, when you're and when you're at that young age, you're kind of like you're just going like there's like you know you have like um, classic like painting like like artwork they do. Then you'd have some would have photos, and but and this particular one was kind of like that's a real skull. Those are real eyes. That and as a kid, you're kind of like wow. That one uh, still to this day, I remember like you make your way through the make your way through the and i always knew what the horror section was but it was always that one always bugged me for some reason and it has stayed with me till the till you know i'm here i here i am in my 40s and i'm kind of like i still remember seeing that as a kid and just being like really creeped out by that shit so. i wouldn't have called that i wouldn't have said that was i wouldn't have remembered that one but now that you say it it was you always saw that cover you know like right. that and you knew you knew immediately what it was um because it stood out because it was a little different because a lot of stuff was painted they were you know a lot of them were paintings at that point but that was very real Uh, yeah no that one that was striking (laughs) yeah man it always yeah it does so um i myself i got into filmmaking because you know my love for storytelling and that's why but i I, but i went down the writing road but everything going back because my father raised me with some of the old stuff that he did so like jaws and uh, a number of the, and one of his favorites was Ray Harryhausen, the stop motion effects that, that mm-hmm. Harryhausen managed. So that was a big influence into going into like how my dad was a big creature feature fan. He loved Godzilla. He loved, you know, big monsters. And one thing that, and I love the stories that they were telling, but he dug that. Now, uh, on your side, making these things, either creating masks or full body suits or envisioning the monster yourself. What got you into that process? Because I know how I got to writing, but you wanted yeah. to make you wanted to make them and bring them to life. Uh, well, it's been a twisted path. <laughs> it hasn't. Yes. It hasn't been great. <laughs> oh yeah, man. It has been a twisted. I've lived many lives. Um, I I initially went to school for music, and and I had a the the one instructor the very first day when I went in for, it was for video and um, you know music and video production. And the guy said, y'all came here because you want to make the greatest album in the history of rock and roll. And, you know, you want to you want to be the greatest musician uh, ever. And you want to you know, you just want to make this. And he said, that's all bullshit. He said, this is not none of that's going to happen. He said, what we do is polish turds. He said, so get used (laughs) to polishing turds because the rest of your life is going to be about polishing turds and then selling them to the market. Um, And and that was. I dropped out of that course um, wow. because, it, and, and the guy, I, you know, I thank the guy because he was so straight, you know, about it. Like he didn't, he didn't candy coat anything. He was, he was honest. And um, so I, I, you know, I may have gotten into more of the film and camera end of things. Cause I, you know, I would have had a video, more of a video oriented degree in editing and everything like that. But um, I was going to, it was the art Institute of Pittsburgh and, they had the industrial design program. Well, they had brought in uh, Jerry Gurgley, who he worked for Optic Nerve um, for many years and did Babylon 5. Um, well, he actually, I'll tell you, the Babylon 5 thing comes later, but he had done a lot of effects for Tom Savini. He had worked in Pittsburgh a lot. Right. He was doing pyro and things like that. And then uh, when I saw the things they were making down there, 
um, you know, because I was always a film, you know, I, I like I said, I grew up watching that stuff in, in that era. And I was like, you know what, I want to do that. I want to go do that because that's cool. And, you know, like the music thing, I was bummed out uh, about that scenario. So uh, I switched over to industrial design um, because I've always, you know, I've always drawn and I've always just, you know, made things. I was making masks before I knew how to make masks. Like uh, we did plaster face casts, I think, in middle school. And, and I made like three or four of them. Like I just kept making them. Um, because it was so much fun. And then I, when I was in high school, I was still making masks out of plaster. Um, and then I was able to take some of those when I, when I went to the Art Institute and show them to the effects guys there. And they were like, oh, wow, the, your sculpting skills are really good. Um, you know, but we want to teach you the right way to do it now. Um, you know, so I was able to learn all that stuff. So I, you know, I, I just always was very hands-on building and, and playing with stuff. My parents had a salvage yard uh, when I was oh, growing cool. up. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, for the time I was eight years old, I was working in a junkyard. So I had to learn mechanics. Um, I worked on cars, which ended up tying in with everything else that I did because I didn't start out in the industry as an effects person. I started out, or I shouldn't say not as a makeup person. I started out as a physical effects person, um, which is a really interesting story. So I, I graduated from the art Institute after I went through all of that and, um, my dad did not want me to be an artist. He wanted me to take over the family business. You know, um, that was very much his dream was that I would, I would run that business and that, that, that would be my life. And, and I was an artist, man. I, I like, that was just not, it, it just wasn't me. You know, I, I, my head was always in the clouds and, and I was always daydreaming and imagining fantasy worlds and, and all of this stuff. I love Dungeons and Dragons. I loved all of that artwork and all of that stuff too. You know? Okay. That, I, okay. I got to jump in just real quick. Yeah. Favorite version, favorite uh, edition of D and D was second edition. Yes, thank you. Okay, second yeah, edition advance. Yeah, that was that, that. was my jam. Okay, got yeah. Okay, go continue on, please. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah, was yeah. My no, own edification it's, it's by far, hands down, absolutely. Um, it was the best artwork. <laughs> also, <laughs> anyway, I mean the the new stuff's great, but like that that was magic. Anyway, right. Um, so I got out of school, and. My dad sort of bought me out it, because he, he I, I had a job offer in Orlando, Florida, which I was we were doing. We actually had to learn 3D as part of the design program. So I was doing 3D Studio Max and, you know, also lots of creatures, sculptures and things like that. So when I had my portfolio table out, um, these two dudes, they had been scouting. I waited to hold it. No one wanted to talk to me because in Pittsburgh. It was a lot of very corporate people coming around to our portfolio tables it, it, and they were looking at, I had blood and gore stuff, you know? So like, they were like, well, uh, who's this guy? You know, I was creepy, <laughs> I, you know, I was a little bit scary. And uh, anyway, so I wasn't getting a lot of attention. I stood there for four hours, wasn't getting a lot of attention. I had, I had watched these two guys walk around and they, they came up to my table and they, they kept getting closer and closer, but they weren't looking at me. They were looking through me at my stuff. And then finally, when they came up, uh, they said, would you be interested in working in video games? Um, and they had a company called N space design. They gave me their card. They, they said they wanted to bring me down to Orlando, which, so when I went home, I thought I was going to go to Orlando. Well, my dad had bought a house. Um, and he, so he had a land contract with somebody. So he basically, he made me this offer. I was broke. I, I was looking, I was, you know, I, I didn't have a lot going on uh, financially and a car that, that barely ran. And, uh, you know, moving to Orlando was a little terrifying. It was something I wanted to do, but I, my my actual real life situation was I didn't have any money, you know. So he basically said, look, I'm going to give you a raise. Um, basically, you'll run the yard and I'm going to give you this house. Um, I, like I had to rent, pay rent, but like at a reduced rate. So. Um, I ended up staying and I didn't go to Orlando because I, you know, it was, it was kind of a premium deal for me at that point. Um, and I regretted it. I regretted it for years, um, for about two years. And in the second year I was underneath of a car, I was torching the rear end out and, um, being very careful, not the gas tank looked a little wet. I didn't want to explode. So, um, <laughs> it was after five o'clock, the yard closed at five. 
and um, I see these feet. Somebody snuck up on me, and I come out from under the car. I have this torch, and I was kind of a dick to this guy because I, I didn't know, I, you know, I didn't know who he was, and and he kind of spooked me. So I come out from the car, and, and I'm like, you know, what the fuck are you doing in here? What do you what do you want? Um, and the guy goes, well, I'm looking for a car. <laughs> we had a thousand cars, so I'm like, for what? And he said, I want to blow it up. That man was Bill Heinzman. Um, no shit. The, Yes, that man was Bill Heinzman, the the zombie number one, uh, the original graveyard zombie from Night of the Living Dead. He lived three miles down the road from my parents. I ended up becoming pretty good friends with Bill, um, and we, you know, that that started a whole relationship. So I'm standing there with this torch, and there's Bill Heinzman. Now I had watched Night of the Living Dead. Was another huge, and that's the thing. I'm from Pittsburgh, man. So. All of that fucking Romero, Romero territory, stuff. baby. Yeah, yeah, man. All the Romero stuff inundated my my youth. You know, Holy it was always shit. there. It was always there. Like, uh, Channel Thirteen or you know WQED here, they would show Night of the Living Dead every year, on you know on like the public the the PBS station. Um, so that I knew I knew who he was. I didn't really know who he was in the moment, but then I realized who he was very quickly. Um, so he's looking at me and we start we start this conversation and uh, you know he said, I'm making a movie and uh, you know so I start gushing because like I went to school for that shit man. I'm like I was super excited. Um, and he said, well, I see you like to play with fire. How would you like a job? And he hired me on the spot. Uh, and it was for Children of the Living Dead, which is one of the worst movies ever made. It's absolute <laughs> garbage. Horrible movie. It didn't need to be because we did such a we did such cool stuff on that show. And um it it just you know fell apart in, in the editing booth and later on, you know, people fighting over it. Um, but I got to work on that and then. He asked me, he said, do you know Tom Savini is? Well, I had met Tom because Tom was very involved with the school at that time. Mm. So, of course, I knew who Tom was. Uh, and then Jerry basically had known Tom for years. They were close because they worked together for years. So um, he was like, well, do you know who Jerry Kirkley is? And I was like, yeah, he taught me. And he was like, well, he's doing pyro for this. Uh, so Bill was cagey. He, he was smart because he knew that he needed, he needed to go a bunch of cars. <laughs> <laughs> he needed a lot of car stuff. And he saw this young kid essentially that like was good with cars, but who also knew effects. So I was a deal for him. I was, I was an absolute deal for him. So he was like, well, we need some police cars. Can you paint police cars? So I painted some police cars. He was like, I need a Volkswagen van that we can put And We were shooting 35 millimeter. He was like, we, we need to put a 35 millimeter at the back of this van. He's like, can you alter the interior of this van? And I ended up recarpeting, do it, reupholstering the whole freaking thing, and put in setting it up for camera, um, nice. and then making it go off a cliff, which was another, it, <laughs> which which was a, an unexpected twist because it just so happened that Jerry couldn't be there that day, and they cornered me and were like, "Hey Jesse, you want to do this really cool?" <laughs> yeah, nice. and I was like, "Oh sure, guys, that sounds awesome." And they're like, "Yeah, we need this van to go off a cliff. You think you could do it?" Yeah. Um, and I did, and I made that happen. So, you know, it, I, I was just, I was maybe 20, 21. Um, Dude, was, you got yeah. to do the, you got to do the classic <laughs> golden age of cinema, how the bad guy or how the good guy dies. And just the, where the, the car's out of control and then, oh, and then off it, you got to do that scene. That's, yeah. That I was right on that that's cusp boss. before digital came in, you know, like I got in right whenever film was still a thing like it was just you know they were going everything's going to go digital it's going to go digital but it hadn't happened yet it was only like big studios that that were doing digital so i got to see what that looked like i got to see that world um and it was it was that old school i had a so i had credits as a stunt driver i had credits as i was an extra i was all over that movie like i, I got to do all kinds of stuff but um you know Basically, we built hot rods in, at the junkyard. We would we would chop old 30s, 40s cars. Like we we made a lot of, of stuff. So I was welding for him. I you know I welded plates in the van. Like I did all kinds of stuff. Um, so I I basically was a fabricator 
<laughs> and I, I became the car, you know, I became the car guy. And then a lot of stuff I did after that was car related. And then of course the explosives, which, so <laughs> in this <laughs> another 35 millimeter, 35 millimeter story. So they hired kids from Point Park as camera assistants. They, so they were students essentially. And I was there about my age because I was, you know, I was pretty young, but um, they, they, we had a big effects day. We had to do like 36 bullet hits, squibs. And I wasn't allowed to touch the squibs. Jerry, Jerry, and they had us in an attic in this old farmhouse. It was like 110 <laughs> degrees in this attic. It was awesome. The guys from Saturday Night Live, Vince Gustini was downstairs doing makeup. Um, so we were upstairs wiring stuff up. So basically I was making blood bags and he had me testing the squibs, you know, uh, doing meter tests on them, just making sure that everything, the wiring was was good. So I was doing a lot of rigging, essentially, was what I was doing. But I wasn't allowed to, you know, nothing to do with the, you know, the button, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was, you don't touch the red button. Um, so, you know, that, that first day we did 36 squibs. I assisted. I So my job was very messy. Basically, I had to run the wiring up somebody's leg <laughs> up through their clothing and then you know he would help me set the plate in the blood bag and um you know we would blow we, well we, a lot of times we would sand the shirt because the shirt wouldn't just break really easily so depending on the material and then we you know he would pull the trigger um and he and he very much supervised me i was just a kid um but he saw that i have a, had a mind for it and then i was i was not <laughs> one of the first things jerry said to me when he hired me he said i've had three assistants i fired all of them I was number four and I was determined to not get fired. I was so scared. It was terrifying. Um, anyway, so we rigged up 36 people. We did all these bullets. They had helicopters flying around, guys with machine guns, and they had every fire department, police department in the whole area was there. Hundreds and hundreds of extras done up as zombies wow. and, and guys. With, it was like, I mean, it felt like you were on the set of, of a Romero movie. You know, it wasn't a Romero movie, but it felt like it. John Russo uh, was writing on that. He was also there involved with it. But um, anyway, so we did all of that. Tom was doing like flips off of cars and shooting people. <laughs> we shot all that stuff. The next day, they they said, hey, guys, we went to watch the dailies last night. And there was nothing there. We have to reshoot it all. The, the film got loaded in the cameras backwards. It was easy. That was an easy mistake to make back then. Oh. If you didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they didn't, you know, they weren't, they had those, those kids working, they weren't supervised. And, and so we lost a whole day, which oh. is not cheap. <laughs> that is not cheap. Especially film was so expensive. So, right. um, so we, they were like, we need those 36 bullet hits, but you know, we needed like 40 more. We were wondering if you guys would get them in one day. And Jerry looks at me and he goes, I have to teach you. I have to teach you. So my second day, no ATF license. You know, it was just, he was like showing me how to wire explosives to humans. Um, and, and that also was extremely terrible. It sounds cool, but dude, it's terrifying because it, that, that shit has to be right. You know, there's no, there's no second chance. It's not, you know, now I use compressed air a lot. I don't like to mess with explosives. Um, if I don't have to, I assist Jerry still to this day, if he ever calls me. Um, but yeah, I, so I, I learned how to wire squibs uh, second day on the job, <laughs> second day on the job. And then um, so that was my introduction to film, you know, so it came in as an assistant and then was very quickly learning how to rig for real. Um, the car, the very first day when Jerry got off the plane, um, we were in his truck and uh, it, he goes, I had, he had this, he had a list. Well, I had the same list and, and Bill had given it to me like oh, three days before he goes, we have to rig this fucking car. And I was like, Jerry, it's done because I, I knew how to work with cars. So the car was ready for him. So when he showed up, the car was ready for rigging. And he was like, well, you know what that means? And I was like, no, and he's like, we fuck off for like three days. <laughs> so <laughs> there's three days we got paid for that was supposed to be for rigging this car, but we, I, it was already done. Um, it was already prepped for him. And so then, um, so then he gives me this, he gave me a laundry list. Uh, he was like, I need you to go to the, the local hardware store and I need you to get me all this stuff. And it's like turpentine and tar and, uh, various household cleaning products. And, um, 
I'm like, what's this for, Jerry? And he's like, well, we're going to make fucking napalm. So, um, <laughs> so then we, we made fuel air incendiaries, um, which basically we had to create a napalm torpedo. And uh, so I was in the back with a, with a garbage can, which was also on the shopping list, lots of garbage bags. Mixing, it's this big guard, 100, it was like 100 degrees. It was, it was one of the hottest summers for some reason. And I'm out there sweating in the, over this garbage can, <laughs> mixing mixing tar and turpentine and all this stuff together. And um, and he had a recipe, you know, uh, every, every every guy has their own recipe. But, um, and I took notes. I took extensive notes. I have notebooks from that that whole era. Anyway, so we made the, the, the proton torpedoes and we shoved them up in there. And I, I remember being in this car um and again the heat was extreme and uh, we we had to build a suspension we had to build a rig to support these things in this in, which again i'm the car guy so i ended up building this having to rig this thing and um you know then hanging these these torpedoes from the ceiling so we're in a 100 degree car with napalm and he hands me this it was like a shampoo bottle but it was wrapped with black tape electrical tape and it had two wires coming out of the top i'm like what's this <laughs> he's like it's a black powder charge i'm like oh cool i was like could this go off he said well don't drag your feet across the rug and um <laughs> I was like, what would what's, happen if what's this off? oh it, it's an ied that's yeah. it's it's, 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 it's an ied is what it is oh thanks buddy <laughs> yeah, here you, go. Well, you know so i'm like okay cool He's, I'm like, what happens if it goes off? He goes, well, your upper torso is a fine red mist. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then we, so, you know, we had to place those in the, in the vehicle is strategically. And we put, we did, we did like six charges in each, um, each car had, uh, you know, six of these incendiaries that we put in it. Um, and again, it was hot. We, you know, we we're working in there. It was very stressful. Jerry cracked jokes the whole time. He made me laugh the whole time because I, I was, I was very, I was scared. You know, I was. Right. Um, but he, he put me at ease. And we have a, we always had a great working relationship because, you like when you do stuff like that with someone, you get, you know, you're on a different level. Um, and I feel like we've always been on a different level. You know, and we've done a lot. We've actually done a lot of pyro together um be, you know because of that experience so so i became his assistant for life after that you know i was worried about being the the fourth one the fourth x on the gun stock essentially but yeah he um he he kept me and uh kept me four times fourth, fourth times a charm hell yeah, yeah. and it's why it's, it's wild because you kick off physical effects basically working with cars you, you know the natural the, the talents that you built up you know uh, at, at the young age and then automatically that that's what I, that's one of the things i love so much about the filmmaking industry is that because you never know what will happen you never know what <laughs> yeah. what doors no. can open and so all of a sudden hey welcome to pyrotechnics which is this other completely wild you know not say you know, but wild field that requires you know obviously a, a deep love and deep appreciation for what they do and and you know the talent that you have for that translated over it's like a, a like a series of fortuitous you know it's kind of like holy shit yeah. kind of like and that that's what I, that's why i love this industry because it, it happens so much i also will never bitch about the heat again hearing this story because <laughs> as an actor i had to i i, I got a part where that 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 it was a you know it was playing some military guy and we were at a barn in uh great uh what would know it was in a like uh some like bfe texas in the middle of freaking summer in july and uh, we were in a barn that obviously no cooling whatsoever and i had to run around this barn with a gun oh. in gear all uh, like for like eight hours getting all these takes and be like this and still maintain my care that was savage so uh, but, uh, yeah, but hearing that <laughs> yeah, what you were doing that uh, I had, we act we actors have it easy. We act crew. Oh, no, I crew have, is the backbone. <laughs> I have great respect for actors. I, I've seen I, I've seen uh, actors go through some shit, man. I, I totally um, yeah. It takes a certain a, a certain nerve and mentality to be able even to just stand there. Even background, a lot of times, you know, you're if it's cold, you're freezing. If it's hot, you're sweating. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I mean, you may be dressed inappropriately for the scenario that you're in. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I, I totally, totally get it. Uh, a big part of our job is trying to make people as, as makeup artists, you know, I, I've done a lot of that. 
our job is to make the actors as comfortable as humanly possible. And we're usually right there with you guys, um, you know, freezing or burning or, or whatever it is. But uh, I have great respect for acting. I, I, and of course, all the it. leads get the big puffy coats when it's well. cold. <laughs> it just, you know, so that's what I was, because it was, it was, it was back in Texas again, this time in like, I think it was December. It was like the November or December. First big freeze had already hit. It was colder as shit. It was like 18 degrees outside. We're shooting at this restaurant that's been completely rented out, and it's supposed to be like you know during the summer, and it's all warm. So the all the actors, all the leads, are up at, up at the bar shooting the scene, and they're all dressed like you know like yeah halter tops and shit like that. And it's like eighteen freaking degrees, and I'm in the back, and I was doing extra work on that. I'm in the back, you know, like kind of like off off uh, off like you know uh, off the left having a conversation like I'm not freezing my ass off next to a girl who is wearing <laughs> like this thin top and is like, you've got to be dying. But that's, that's our pantomime. It's like, you've got to be freaking dying in this. It's absolutely insane. How cold is it? Because they couldn't run the heater. You can't right. run the heater of the deal because you're picking up on sound. It's like, oh, um, and then of course, cut. And then the big puffy coats come on. And then we're all like, where's our, <laughs> where's our coats? Right. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Well, main talent, is, that's everybody's goal, yeah. right? Um, right. You, want, you want to have your own tent, that your own heated trailer? Or tent or whatever they're going to get but you know the rest of us that's okay we just got we, we got an oil barrel <laughs> with a fire over here thank you very much <laughs> we'll just... no one no one understands no one understands that outside you know because people imagine movies as this big glamorous thing and and maybe it is for that handful of people that are being pampered but there are hundreds of people behind them who are not being pampered and that's that's going to be us yeah so. hundreds of people in tattered clothes sweating our asses off and freezing our butts off in the winter warming our hands by the oil drum fire we managed to cobble together from the dumpster Ugh, but oh yeah crew crew back that's that's amazing and pyrotechnics has always been so wild because it's it's such an intense field obviously because of explosion stuff but that uh it that's it's wild that you got that opportunity that door opened on a project that you never would have expected, which I think is so cool. Kind of like how that, how that swung together like that. Another thing that I learned from that. And I think that I've, I, I've always, I've always been a problem solver. You know, that's always, and like you said, film, you never know what's coming. You never know right. what you're going to run into. And, and so that, that mentality, my adaptability in, in different you know scenarios. And that's what Jerry years later, when Jerry hired me as, as an instructor at his school at, at Tom school, um, you know, it was, that was his thing is you're, I was like, Jerry, I don't know how to teach. I don't have a degree in teaching. And he's like, but you, you'll figure it out because you're adaptable and you know how to, you know, to figure things out. So, um, I think that that's worked for me and, and being in that scenario, another thing too, because it was film, they wanted it, all the effects people had, they, they expected us to be like snipers, one shot, one kill. And, and when you're blowing up a car, you only get one shot. Right. You know, I mean, you do. So, you know, everything we did, it, I feel like we were held to a higher level. And I don't, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, have a generation gap, you know, discussion. But like, I think with digital, it became much easier for people. And, it, you know, now you can just, we can fix it in post or, you know, there, there's so many things that you can do with, with digital now. Um, we didn't have that option. The physical effect was what it was. They were very expensive. And they needed to be right the first time. You had one one shot literally to get the take. And that Jerry, watching him, he was like a ninja. Like I saw him do stuff with uh, fish line. I saw him do stuff, you know, with just like crazy stuff with like whenever they were shooting. He had a slingshot with to do spark hits. He had a slingshot and he would shoot a glass off a bar, you know, like one shot wonder every single time. Because it'd be actors running around behind it. And, it, and they were like. You're not going to hit us, Jerry. And like, I fucking got you, man. Just go. You know, like he would nail it. He was, I mean, it just, you don't, just, I don't know. It was a different world. And especially in the indie world, like Bill liked to use real guns with, you know, a lot of blanks. Um, it was like the wild west in a way, you know, like, and, and then after 9-11 that changed, you know, right. but um, it, there was, there was a kind of a freewheeling filmmaking atmosphere with that uh, in that indie realm, especially. Now, as as typically as crew. Now, uh, I I've done I've not done a lot of crew work myself, but I am happy to say that uh, Johnny O, one of the members of our of the Weekend Horror crew, had, it, that's pretty much what he does. He gaffs and he uh, does rigging, is electrical, and a number of other what pretty much whatever he needs. Kind of a jack of all trades behind the scenes. If you need him on something, he's on it. Now, 
but one thing I have no insight on, I'm kind of curious, I think our audience might, might be curious about, because as a writer and a director, we, you know, it, the stuff that I've done, we de- we deal with kind of our own ways of navigating the industry. From your experience with the projects you've worked on and and more like the, the behind the scenes, have you found like something, is, is there something different or something more intense as far as the, as far as the relationships go when it comes to navigating the industry as professional crew? Um, so like I said, I've been in a lot of different, um, sections of the industry as far as like physical effects, we don't have a ton of interaction with, uh, actors, you know, because usually what we're doing, we're, we're doing away from the actors. We're trying to keep the actors away from whatever that thing is that's happening. If I'm on the, so if I'm the physical effects side, it's one sort of atmosphere. Um, and then if I'm on the makeup end of things, that is very much a relationship that you build with actors. Um, and, you know, like I've worked with different actors at various times and, you know, that they remember you um, and they were, especially if you're good, they remember you and they remember you they remember your bedside manner, so to speak. And like mm-hmm. how you act. I always, um, I always have gum. I found that gum is the universal uh, opener of doors as a makeup artist. It's just always have Tic Tacs and gum and, and things like that because uh, we don't have a lot of time, you know, we're rushing through lunch and a lot of things like that. I also keep like the little flossers for after lunch, little things like that uh, mean a lot to an actor when they're on the run, when they've got, we've got no time, uh, you know, and I found I've, <laughs> and then they end up hey, where's jesse at you know like i need i need gum but it's just uh you know little sometimes there's little icebreaker things that you do to to create a relationship and and be memorable and um you know it, it, that has has worked for me um yeah i mean d- actors everybody's different you know i i've had great rapport with some not so much with others uh you know and there's Mm -hmm. relationships that i've created that i've lasted for years out of that so um you know i i've i've been lucky uh you know i do a lot of extra work i do a lot of background um i've gotten to know a lot of those background because they're on every show in this town every time there's a show i see the same background over and over and over again in different roles you know um and, and you get to know people. So, you know, there's a magic to that. Um, and, and yeah, it's a lot of our job as makeup artists, like I said, is to make the actor feel comfortable, help them. You want to help them get into character, stay in character and, and be comfortable doing it and also make them look their best, right? You know, for the, for the scenario. And they may, they may need to look like shit, but they need to look the best shit that, that you can make, right? So um, maybe they're covered in blood or whatever, but it needs to look, they need to look great. They need to feel like they're, they're able to go and do that work, you know, and be in character. So that's a lot of what we have to do. Definitely. I was always really, I was always kind of curious because as far as like what crew, like what our, what our crews do and whether it's physical effects or special makeup effects or puppetry or whatever is that there's, I've always seen that there was kind of a difference in the product that's being put out by the creative individual, whereas actors and actors are putting out a performance. That's their product. And directors are cobbling the, the, the visual image, you know, but so they're, they're capturing images and the, like the, the camera person or whatever, whoever's, every, but every, all that work is kind of ephemeral because they're taking something that you can't really put your hands on, you know, whereas crew, typically you're, you're in the trench. And you've got your hands on something physical that is right there, like that car that's about to go off a cliff or detonate three ways from Sunday. That's a work of art. That is your product that you have put out. And I've always wondered that translated to how you navigate that, you know, because there seems to be like what we're hands on. It's more cerebral in one deal, how that translates to navigating the industry as far as relationships go, like how you and I see how the like the 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 relationships you build with the actors you work closely with. And I always wondered if that translated to the politics of it because there's so much, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's really more about the camaraderie, I think is what I was getting from you. Yeah. I, so <laughs> navigating the industry, um, it's tough, man. It's, you know, it, it never gets easier. Um, it, you build your network and you hope, you know, you, you hope that you get on the next thing and you hope that those people remember you or whatever. Um, I, here's an interesting story. Cause it is, I think a lot of it is about relationships. I, so on children, 
they had somebody doing BTS videoing the whole thing. And he was another college kid. And um, I remember him not being treated very well by um, some people in production. Like he was, they just treated him like he was, uh, you know, accessory. Um, but I, but he loved the effect stuff and he was always up there filming us and, and we would talk. And um, I had a really horrible business card that I had made. It was the worst business card. Of, it was just this horrible business card. I had give it to this, this guy. He's, I want to say kid, but we were the same age at the time. So I give him my business card. Seven years later, I get a phone call and guy says his name. <laughs> it's like, you remember me? I'm like, no. <laughs> you like, together on children. I was doing behind the scenes. I was like, oh yeah, man, I remember you. He's like, well, I've been carrying your card in my wallet for seven years. He's like, I'm, I'm the DP on this feature. We need a car to split in half. We need a guy to karate chop a car in half. And he said, I know just the guy to do that. So you never know, man, like it could be an extra, it could be, you know, some, some guys shoot behind the scenes. You got to create those relationships. And if you're not a dick, you'd be amazed how much stuff, I mean, I can't tell you how many extras that I've worked with over the years who have their own production company, who are doing an indie somewhere. Like it, it's, you got to treat everybody like they're a star because you don't know, you don't know. I Like I worked on a lot of stunt guys over the years and I didn't realize for, for a lot of those years, how influential stunt guys are, how much pull they're SAG, you know, mm -hmm. they're SAG, they're actors, um, you know, in a lot of them, they make big bucks. So, you know, oh, yeah. okay, they're not big star, but they're, they're a star in their own right. And, uh, you know, you don't realize sometimes like how much pull some of those people have. So yeah, it a lot of it really is about relationships and, uh, you know, and doing good work. I mean, you have to have an artistic bent to get into this, you know, it's on this end of it. So it, it, it's, that's important. And you have to nurture that and work at it for your whole life. Absolutely. Now of, of the two things that you prim primarily focus on, which is special effects, makeup and uh, pyrotechnics. So I, I took the time and I wanted to check it because you had some, um, there, there's some interesting stuff in your filmography and I really enjoyed going through it, but there were two that really stood out to me that I think were solid examples. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about them, but the first one was obviously special makeup effects would be the family. And that one got okay. my attention because yeah. as you can tell, I'm a big Friday the 13th fan and Kane Hodder is my favorite. You know, I've, I've had a chance to meet Kane a few times. He's a really cool dude. He actually uh, did the choke out to me where I got a picture of him choking yep. me out like, like that. So I had him do that one time. Um, but Kane's a really cool guy, but not just Kane, but Tony Todd as well. And which I was like, okay, I got to give this thing a look. This looks pretty wild. And it was a, a pretty wild film. But the experience of that going into that, because starting from where you started and then all of a sudden, bam. So Joe Hollow uh, was uh, the director writer, director, actor, producer on that. I met him on another indie. And that's another scenario where um, you meet somebody, you create a relationship, and then it, it leads to other things. He was producing something else at the time. And we worked together and we just hit it off. And he was like, dude, when I do my next movie, I'm calling you. And he did. He did. And that was uh, that was for the family. Now, he had Chris Mills, Sh Silver Shamrock Studios. Chris Mills, another great effects dude. Um, he... Is, was an LA guy for many years, but he he's now, I believe, in Georgia. Um, he, so Chris Mills did stuff for the Deadliest Warrior, and he was he built a lot of bodies. That was his thing was corpse corpses nice. and things like that. The bodies that they would chop with swords and stuff they shoot. Um, but there were some physical effects on that that he wasn't. And so and so Pyro it morphed from Pyro to where I was more of a physical effects troubleshooter. I would do whatever physical effects thing people needed. I could figure it out. Um, and so I ended up doing physical effects on that show. Um, the first thing that they, they told me they needed was, and they, they called me like a week before I had very little prep time. Um, they needed Michael Berryman to be crucified. To, yes. Yeah. They yeah that crucify. was, oh, that was wild. Okay. And they, they needed him to be suspended in a doorway in a historic prison <laughs> um which i've actually worked in several times uh like because they have a haunt there i did the haunt as well as some several film things um so 
uh, they were like, how can you do this? Well, I, so I had to basically get permission to drill into the, the, um, stone because it was all built out of, out of these huge sandstone slabs. Um, so we had to drill into the stone and then basically more create these moorings that he could stand on and then also support his body on. And, and they didn't want him in like a, the classic position, like they wanted him lower. Also there was, you know, was the actor's comfort level and things like that. So, right. um, we had to do that, but then they also needed to have him being stabbed with a machete from behind by Kane. By Kane, by Kane Otter. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah, put man. that machete in his hand. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, you know, so there was a lot going on in that one shot. Uh, and Michael, and, and Michael Berryman a, a, is a total champion. Oh, that dude, I love will, him. He'll do anything. I love him to death so much. When, what, that was one of one of the, the greatest experiences in my life. I was, so I got him, I was like, hey, man, we're going to put you in this rig. I was like, I, I need you to be comfortable. Like, I want you, you know, help me out here, like, where, you, what you feel this needs to be if I need to make any changes. And he was like, yeah, let me get in there. And um, he got up in there and we're talking. He's just suspended in the wall. And, and we're, we're having this conversation. <laughs> the, man, the man is brilliant. Like he has a mind like a college professor. Like he used to sit there and talk. And, and this is the guy from The Hills Have Eyes, right? Like he's, right. he's a little Wrath of Khan, you know? I, like he's he can be, you'd think he'd be terrifying. He's, he's really very soft-spoken, very easy to talk to, extremely knowledgeable, you know, um, worldly guy. And we're, we just, we're having this awesome conversation. Well, we heard cameras up and he goes, all right, I got to get into character. And he was like, ah, just start screaming. <laughs> he went just like that from, you know, just have this, this really intellectual conversation to be in the psychotic killer scenario. So, um, awesome, awesome working with him. Kane, uh, it Kane has such a presence and he's so he's, he's so powerful on film. I mean, that's, that's what made, made him who he is. Um, and I've got to work with him a couple times now. And he, he shared a lot of stuff about his stunt life with me and all the things that he's done. The guy has had such an amazing career. You know, he, he was telling me about working on the Dukes of Hazard. you know, I mean, it's like, you, you don't realize, cause you remember him from Friday the 13th. Obviously everyone knows him from that, but, the guy had a whole other life as a stuntman doing so much other stuff. And uh, he's, you know, he's just got so much, so much back history and so much stuff to talk about. Um, Tony Todd, also really amazing um, to work with. He's, he's very, very sweet, gentle person, you know, to talk to and to just hang out. Very great conversationalist as well. So uh, that was a great experience. And, you know, there I was with, with these legends you know, and then happen to impale one of them and, you know, <laughs> nail one to the wall and, and impale them and, and figure all that stuff out. And there was a lot of other problem solving that we had to do on that. But the rig that goes through Michael Berryman was actually like an old sword trick. Um, it was the old wraparound. It was a wraparound rig. Um, so, you know, it actually slides around his body and comes out and it's, you know, it's a very thin sheet of styrene. So you, but you're seeing it from a profile and you don't know that. Um, and then obviously we had to run blood and all of that kind of stuff, but, um, and it was freezing cold that, you know, like we talked about it was freezing cold in that place. Like you could see your like ice forming when you, every time you breathed, but, um, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun and it was, uh, it was a lot of work, but, uh, yeah, that, that it seemed like they all, it seemed like everybody had a blast in there. And I was kind of, I was kind of, I was really impressed because, um of the of the horror of the, the horror legends that were in that michael berryman tony todd and uh and kane hotter they also landed i was kind of i was like holy shit katie parker's in this because katie parker oh, is one of that, is yeah. one of the flanagan uh regulars you know who's been in you know because abs absentia flanagan's absentia is one of my all-time favorite I, I love that movie you know and i followed him ever since uh ever since uh, you know like ouija so it was like, oh, you know, Absentia, Ouija, Oculus. And then, of course, you know, he blew up on Netflix with, you know, Midnight Mass. If you haven't seen that, it's like, holy I shit. Know. So, but, uh, but yeah, I was like, holy crap. There's like, you know, a bunch of people. I thought it was really neat. Joe, and, uh -huh. Joe gets a lot of people. He He's really good with people in, in um, getting talent. And he has, he has a lot of connections in that world. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I think that we're going to do some more stuff together. I've been talking to him recently. Um, got a lot of irons in the fire right now. I mean, you know, you never know until it, until it's happening. But uh, it looks like I may be doing some more stuff with Joe Hall Productions. So we'll see. Very cool. Very awesome. And the other one that caught me was because uh, you were pyrotechnics on Death From Above, which yep. is a... F- I don't want to for anybody out there who's listening, for any of the audience out there listening to this, I don't want to spoil it too much, but you can definitely check this out. Um, it is available out there. So go and see it. Death from Above and the family. So go and check those out if you haven't seen them yet. But that one, uh, that one was, I think, the most intense. It was pretty intense work. And what was that experience like? Because and such a wildly different film. The monster truck scene stands out to me right it, it, like that whole um the whole thing with the monster the monster trucks were cool um so you know they had wrestlers involved with that they had yes monster trucks. it Fucking was like uh um it was crazy uh and, i still can't get again, the milk i still can't get kurt angle's milk thing out of head whenever i yeah. fucking see him it's just i just i was like i was like but that's kurt angle he's he yeah no, 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 folks I'm okay so. <laughs> It's Kurt Angle, yeah, and they've done a few things with Kurt Angle. I, I worked on another thing for them where I made a, I made a, some prop stuff for them, and uh, they, yeah, they were using Kurt for that too. But, um, yeah, we so they they called him, they called us up, and they were like, we need to shoot Kurt Angle. <laughs> we need, we need you guys to shoot <laughs> Kurt Angle. Um, so we're, we're like, sure, and then Jerry got the call, and he he called me, and he's like, he's like, hey, you want to go shoot Kurt Angle? I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, fuck yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> You know, so um, we want to do we want to do we want to do Kurt Angle, we want to do fucking uh, Robert Zadar, and we want to do Tom Sabini all in the same movie. And I was like, this is this is just oh, like, it's, just, it's just Tom was in that, yeah. It There's just so speaks, many yeah, that. yeah. It just, he was the he was the sheriff, yeah, yep. Rainick. So yeah, it just the the, the film just spoke. It was like, oh holy shit, because I've loved Tom ever since Maniac. You know, when he jumped up on that freaking windshield, you know, jumped up on that hood, and it was like, bite him through the windshield. Classic oh shotgun, fuck, shotgun oh yeah. Picks. <laughs> um tom has been amazing uh to work with over the years uh he's another one he's just a wealth of knowledge and um he's been really good to me he wrote me an amazing letter of recommendation when i left the school um and uh i cherish that i have it on my wall because it's just very cool you know, uh so the thing uh, with death from above they were like you want to shoot kurt yeah yeah we're gonna do that and then um we get there and they're like hey um we have all these cultists. <laughs> <laughs> we have all these cultists and we need them to get shot with a shock. So that was not in the original deal. We we get there. And, and again, it's it's the, the troubleshooter thing. Um, so Jerry's like, well, you want to wire up some cultists? And uh, so then here we go. So then, uh, you know, next thing I know, I'm wiring up shotgun hits uh, on on all these cultists. And, and they, it, it, that was fun. Because we did a lot of cutaways, did a lot of insert shots. We got them running. We had them like, you know, just standing there and getting blasted, which is always like, okay, we're going to do a countdown, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, those poor extras, because they didn't know they were getting shot with a shotgun either, right? <laughs> um, so this is what's going to happen today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also think it was freezing cold that night. Yeah, yeah. It's always I remember cold. correctly, it was also freezing cold. Well, better cold, better cold than everybody sweating their balls off. Because I, I can I deal know, with man. cold. Once the once the adrenaline, maybe it's maybe it's me. Maybe I'm because I I prefer the cold over the heat. Just because with cold, once you get the adrenaline going and you get focused on what you're focused on the task, you can kind of forget it. Like heat just permeates everything. Right. It never just, goes away. Never goes away. It's like because because when you get the adrenaline going, now you're hotter. And you're even more <laughs> uncomfortable. And it's like, I'm really in the zone. Fuck, I am dying here. <laughs> I think it's different for actors. Because I've actually heard a lot of actors say that. I think for crew, uh, like, my thing is, I would rather sweat. Because once your feet get cold, they're like bricks. And you just <laughs> oh, can't get hands. warm. Your you can't get warm. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, they don't do anything. <laughs> so for, for crew, I would say, I, I would rather, I mean, and that's, I mean, that's my opinion. Everybody's different. But I, I would rather be hot. Um, I also grew up working in sweltering heat, you know, for mostly. So I feel like I got attuned to that a little more. And the cold, I worked in the cold too, but I hate, always hated winter. Just, you know, the cold, uh, being outside in it all the time. Um, I'd rather have summer. 
So, that, I mean, that's just my opinion, but everybody's different. And the thing is, like, you guys have to stay in character, which is hard. It can be. It can be. It can be. You know, if there's, you know, depending upon what's going on around there, you know, it's just, ah, uh, but man, yeah, prefer the definitely call. I think it's because I was in Texas, because I grew up in Texas and, you know, two a days, football two a days oh, in yeah. the heat. And so, <laughs> You know, it's like, you know, I was for the, and then all of a sudden we get that welcoming you know, winter of like, yes, bring it down 18, 15, 10, two degrees. This is, this is fantastic. Let's shoot it's a movie. Like there. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, so it's fascinating that you brought it up. I'm glad that you did bring it up. You, you, you got, uh, I would say, I personally think you got lucky and you got to kick off touching on film because I think it's like, cause you also did music. And I think there was that old joke is like, if you haven't recorded on four, if you haven't recorded on four channels, then you're not an actual musician. Is that old joke? It's like if you haven't worked directly with film, you know, can you really say you're a filmmaker? Because, and I remember you talking about putting in the real backwards and think that I've seen that happen working on a number of student projects when I was getting when I was going through school when I was going through film school and watching them like they'll put their hands in the bag and they're making the switch and then all of a sudden you know it's like no no it's all and then I've seen it happen before it can. It's you it's know easy, it's easy yeah. mistake to make because you you got your hands in there and you're trying to feel and everything. So and but and moving to transitioning through digital transitioning you know, like which is an area that Eugene just does not he doesn't like the the, the 2000s because that's yeah. what became really prevalent and so he's not a fan of that. But how have you uh, you mentioned that you're adaptable and that's that's excellent. How have how has been your adaptation to advancing technology especially here we are in 2024 you know when things are so radically different we have filmmakers themselves oh, yeah. who are actually changing the game you know and it doesn't require like a cameron or a spielberg to do it now you get your hands on the right thing anybody can do it so how are you adapting through that um i mean ai is a bit terrifying i i think uh you know that's that's a game changer but i also think what you know the 2000s thing um, you know, Y2K, all that stuff. It, it's, it's like that stuff comes and goes. Um, I, I hated digital for many years. Uh, and then I, I embraced ZBrush, uh, and I started making, doing a lot of character design in ZBrush and I find that it's better. It's quicker. I can make changes more rapidly. It's great to be in a pipeline where I could send that off to, you know, whoever I'm working with studio or, uh, indies, whatever, and, and show them real time changes in a, in a design. Uh, so I've found on that end of it, especially on the concepting, it's very helpful. Um, as far as effects go, it's always a battle. I, I will say that I hated the VFX, you know, end of it for a long time and how they, you know, I did, it felt like a cartoon, you know, right. it just didn't, it never felt real to me. It didn't have the weight. It's gotten better over the years. And then I've worked with some really amazing VFX people who I I see that if you cooperate and if you both have the same lang you know, language and understanding of, of the situation, um, you can actually make it better. You know, because if, if they understand what I'm doing and I understand what they're doing, sometimes you can make something that would look better than one or the other. You know, so they, they can work together. They can accent, accent each other. Um, not always, but when that scenario comes along, when I can work with a VFX team that that we can speak that language together, it, it's it's usually turns out way better for everyone. Right. Um, so you know, there's that. But I think you know we've seen over the years where everybody wanted to do everything digital in the early 2000s, and you know even up into the teens, and then there was this twist where everyone was like, you know what, let's go practical. Because everybody's sick of this. I think the audience was sick of it. People got sick of digital. You know, it, it was just everywhere on everything. Sci-Fi Channel, you know, killed it. Uh, it was just, yeah, yeah. It, it was just asylum. Asylum. Everything was, everything was <laughs> then being compared to that. And and um, you know, I think directors especially started to say, "I want my my stuff to have weight. I want it to feel real. I don't want it to feel like a cartoon. I don't want to be compared to Sharknado. You know, and yeah. and that kind of thing." So. Um, that we saw a resurgence of physical and that's gone on for like the last 10 years. I think AI is the new toy. It's, it's uh, here, you know, and it, it'll just like when CGI came in, CGI was a bad word, but Jurassic Park was freaking amazing. There's ways that it works, right? I mean, AI has its place. It's going to have its place. 
everyone's afraid it's going to replace us. I don't think it will. I think it might for a while because that's what happened with CGI. All of a sudden they had a new toy and they were like, all right, fuck you guys. We're going to do everything with CGI. Right. And then the audience said, it still looks like CGI. We're sick of it. I think maybe that might be the way this plays out. AI kind of comes in, everything's AI for a while. And then they go, you know what? We need that marriage of both the physical. We need that weight of physical still. Um, and I think you're going to have a lot of auteurs out there who are just like, I don't want it. I, right. you know, I mean, the Tarantino mindset, they want physical, they want real, um, especially in indie. I think it'll be a boom time for indie because they're, you're going to have the big budget stuff that is all AI generated and like indie can still plug that give us that 80s feel, you know, and, and that I think people love that. They still we still love that. I love it. You know, like I want to watch stuff that feels like that. So it's terrifying. We're, we're going to lose work. I, no doubt. There's no doubt in my mind we'll lose work, um, especially on big budget. But there's always going to be a place for makeup. There's always going to be a place for physical effects. And I think there's always going to be a subsection of filmmakers who just don't want to do it that way. Right. Uh, you know, it, you know, and, and um, you know, it, it remains to be seen. More, it's all speculation, but uh, that's well, it's interesting. It, yeah, it's interesting that you bring that you that you touch on that because that how the cycles that the industry tends to go through. Because we recently on the on the last episode. We got to talk about Mystery of the Wax Museum, which came out in 1933. Okay. Yeah. And in Mystery of the Wax Museum, uh, Warner Brothers was running with Technicolor. They were running their two-color option, which was red and green. Yeah. And so Technicolor had not yet released their three, their three-color uh technique yet. They were they were still perfecting it at the time. But Warner Brothers recognized that audiences were getting burnt out on color. Like the novelty of color was wearing off. That's because that's funny. The, the quality control wasn't there and it, things came out looking weird and it's like, it's not realistic. And Warner brothers wanted to go back to doing black and white. They're like, his color just, that. yeah. So, and uh mystery of the wax museum was the final, uh, was the last two toe was the last two color technicolor movie released because, and the, and Warner brothers was forced to do that because technicolor got mad at them because they did Dr. X right before wax museum and they they secretly they shot it they were they were contractually obligated to do uh uh mystery of the wax or to do dr x in color that was them in technicolor but then they secretly did a, a backup they had an alternate unit. i had a black and white unit running at the same time so they shot them both it's like okay we got a color print that fulfills our contract obligation but we also have a black and white print that we can process at our house and do it in house, not use. And Technicolor got pissed and held them to finish their contract with a uh, wax museum. But they knew they saw it that color came along. Ooh, it's color! And then all of a sudden, you know, it goes long enough, and it was kind of like what we saw with with the uh, with uh, what Eugene points out: digital effects or digital film in the two thousands. It was this new hotness, and then all of a sudden, we're getting asylum. Not to knock the asylum. There's people out there that love them. I understand that, but. We're getting asylum style, sci-fi style movies coming out, and it's like, right. uh, let's pull, let's pull it back to practical, you know, or maybe a combination of the two, maybe more practical than this. Maybe you know, Steven, we, we need Steven Spielberg to build fucking dinosaurs, you know, to remind us of how much we love that shit. There's a place for everything, you know. I don't, I don't think that, I, I think that AI in a lot of ways is probably a wonderful tool. I mean, I, I see on the concepting end again, especially because I, I live in that world too. Like I see where that works. Like I see how you, well, wow, that, you know, you can really quickly create a character or do a mashup of, of existing characters and, and it's cool. Um, and that's terrifying to a lot of us that do that are used to doing that stuff by hand, but it's no different, you know, than the, the guys that were, you know, doing drafting, um, and when Photoshop came out, you know, you're going to have to move with the curve. You're going to have to figure that out there, you know, to some degree, um, there may not be a place for draftsmen. There may not be a place for people that, that do, um, you know, like the classical, um, graphic design art type of doing it. Now it's all going to be in the computer. Um, you know, I think we may have to move with that curve. Um, and then for those that can't, you know, I think there will be a place for the old school techniques and, and all of that stuff. 
and like I said, there'll always be auteurs that just don't, they don't, they're not having it, you know, purist, yeah, purist, golden age style. Yeah. Good. I'm glad, you know, yeah. and, and I, I hope that there's more of that. I, I, I celebrate that, you know, thought process. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, we're going to take a hit guaranteed. Hmm. We are like all of us here at the, here at Week in Horror, we're all be a big practical purist. Uh, the uh, the slasher film that we're currently uh, pushing towards getting into pre-production is going to be uh, total 100% practical effects because, awesome. you know, we want that. And plus, we find you know, all of us are very much like this is about it's not just about making a movie. It's about the opportunities that practical effects provides is is what it's about. We all need to work. It is a gig industry, essentially. And so the more practical effects we have, the more jobs we can provide to people because you need more hands on deck and the more hands on deck, the better you, the better it, that that's what we love about it. We love the collaborative effort when it's sitting there on a computer screen. Sure. It may be cheaper, but what are you really gaining in the long run? You know, the, there's some that's things that just, should, yeah, it shouldn't be automated. Yeah. In my personal opinion. It's a shame because your crew, crew is a family, yeah. you know, like when you work on crew, you, you get to know people and it, it's very much like a family unit. And, um, you it, it binds us together you know um and it's an experience that you're not going to get anywhere else in the world you know doing any other job like it's very unique um it creates an atmosphere on set and for the actors it they they feed off of that you know they feed off of that atmosphere they feed off of, of the, the camaraderie and all of that stuff um and and it just seems like the industry is always trying to kill that um and i i don't you know i it's all about money it became a corporate, became less of an art thing and more of a corporate uh, money making thing on the on the higher levels, uh, you know. So it's being run that way. But the core of what film always was from the from the very its infancy was about artists. It was about artists collaborating. It was about an atmosphere, um, you know. And and that's what made great films for you know the the golden era on up. Um, so yeah, it it uh, it's going to be damaging. It's going to be because they keep deconstructing those family units, you know, um, more and more people drop out of the industry. Uh, you know, the strikes hurt us. Obviously, they need to happen, but we lose people and they never we're never getting some of them back. You know, people right. retire. People just say, I'm done. Um, and, and you're also killing your new pool of talent coming in. You're not giving them anything to grow on. So you're going to as, as we all age, the, the generation of people that grew up in 35 millimeter land are going to be gone. And where do you, how do you replace that knowledge? It's, it's, it's a, it's a different kind of knowledge. Like I said, one shot, one kill. You're not going to have that um, coming in. So when you do need that, I can charge a premium and, you know, it, it's, it, yeah, it's going to become, you're going to become then coveted because that thing is not, no longer exists. It happened with stunt guys. You know, it's happened over the years with stunt guys. They were replaced by digital early on. Um, you know, so these are, these are things that are going to happen. I don't think there's st any stopping it, but we just have to ride the waves, man. It's, it's yeah. going to be, it's going to be, and unfortunately I, I do think we are going to, we are going to take some hits. And I tell you the day, the day I learned in my career, the day I learned what ROI meant, I, I lost a piece of my innocence. I swear. I really, really did. So given stuff. that. <laughs> so given the uh given the few you know given the uh, the obvious uncertainty of the future you know you never know what's going to happen but you yourself uh are there any particular goals or individuals might want you 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 hope to work with one day or things that you want to do from effects wise or uh physical you know however that you kind of like that's something you want to angle at or a person you know people you want to work with um i've been really lucky um, here's the funny thing about luck, you know, because I, I people say that, you know, you, you're lucky. So being lucky means getting an opportunity, right? And when you have an opportunity, you can fuck it up if you're not prepared. I've been lucky because I've had skill sets and life experience that when those opportunities arose, I was able to take that life experience and the, the knowledge that I had and always able to twist it in and make it fit into whatever hole it needed to fit into, you know? Um, but I'm always looking for those opportunities. I've been lucky to work with Tom. I've been, I've been lucky to work with obviously Jerry and, um, 
I, I got to work with Steve Johnson, um, who created nice. Slimer. Uh, you know, I, and he was one of my heroes. I, you know, I always wanted to be like those guys. Um, you know, so uh, I want to keep making monsters. I want to make creature stuff. I love monsters. I love creatures. You know, that's that's the world that those are the guys that I always looked up to and idolized. You know, is like I said, a, a child of the '80s. Um, you know, I, that's that is the dream. I'm living that dream, uh, which is it's hard to do. It's not always easy, but uh, you know, that's the world that that I'm in. And yes, I am lucky. I, I'm lucky to be doing what I'm doing and and to have had the life experiences that I've had, met the people that I've met, worked with them, um, and got to be friends with a lot of them. So, uh, yeah, that's that's. Uh, on on as far as film goes that's really where i would love to be is just a creature designer um nice. you know and, and i i always think i'll have my hands in a little bit of physical a little bit of makeup but uh creatures creatures are my that's my thing so looking at your website at jessieleechalk.com, that's J-E-S-S-E-L-E-C-H-O-K.com for anybody out there listening. Yeah, I've seen I've seen the 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 examples of your work, your uh your sculpts, your digital designs, creature designs, physical effects. It's all fantastic. It, it all looks amazing. I have to ask, is there a monster that you want to make or you'd like to work on that you haven't touched yet? Hmm. That's tough. Uh, I ask. I ask this because it was recently announced that Guillermo del Toro is moving forward with his Frankenstein film, and okay. Frankenstein has always been del Toro's kind of like that. That's his goal. Like with the uh, with Peter Jackson, it was always King Kong. King Kong was his goal, okay. and like you know, del Toro, it was always about Frankenstein. Karloff is what kicked off his career. Is what pretty much would send him in that direction. And I'm wondering if there's that monster. You haven't got to work yet, but you really want to. So I was able to do a short. I, I love Lovecraft. Huge Lovecraft fan. Um, I've always wanted to make, yeah, very Lovecraftian <laughs> stuff. Um, you know, so anything in that vein that I get to work on. I love like In the Mouth of Madness. Um, you know, that's what's one of my favorite. Um and uh, oh god, what was the one? There, there were a couple of them that have come out in the last few years. Um, I probably actually even the last ten years, I'm going to say, uh, that were that were very Lovecraft oriented, um, and and all of that, that kind of stuff. I, I would like to do uh, as much of that. The thing I said, you know, that's another one. So tentacle monsters, things like that. I, I love I love just disturbing creatures, and I also love sci-fi. So aliens. Any type of alien work, I, I'm all about it. You know, creating characters. Um, the I I sent you the links to the the projects that I'm involved with right now. Um, one of them is Testament. Um, so we're we're in pre-production. I'm work, still working a lot of the budget stuff out as far as how we're going to build certain things. You know, so it's early in the game, um, but we're going to create some very un, otherworldly characters for this uh so it's going to be cool um really love working with these guys uh walker light media they um have great ideas that the script what will holman read, uh, wrote it and it is it's amazing um it's dystopian future uh also so not too far away um and it's all stuff that i think we can all see on the horizon as well so just like we're talking about ai um you know their ai is involved uh, climate is involved, um, minority scenarios, class scenarios, uh, division of wealth and resources involved in it as well. You know, sci-fi is magical in that, you know, we can tell those stories that mm -hmm. sometimes we can't really tell them uh, otherwise. And it, it's able to create this world where we can kind of see some of the social injustices and some of the things that are happening that you know we we know are happening and it's coming but it, it's going to play out a certain way in this story and i think it's really interesting so very um cool. yeah yeah it is very cool and and they're a great bunch of people and i i'm really excited to uh create this character because it's a female character and um i think it's going to be very empowering for a lot of people uh and then they're going to have a sort of avatar of this character on social media that people will be able to interact with so um it, it's sort of a sci-fi it's a mashup it's sort of like a sci-fi superhero 
um, action film uh, with dramatic elements. Is, <laughs> so I guess that's the best way to describe it. There's a lot going on, but um, really, really excited for that one. Um, also creating a creature um, for uh, another company right now. Um, the film is called Treaters. They are on Indiegogo uh, and they are still, uh, you know, trying to reach their goal on Indiegogo and they're a great bunch. They're Pittsburgh locals, great bunch of people as well. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited for that one. It's going to be a fun, it's going to be a fun build for me. Uh, awesome. So yeah. Uh, and that's very eighties inspired, very eighties inspired. There's a lot of humor in the, in the writing. Uh, also it's a very fun script. Uh, so those, those I'm, I'm very excited about for the future. And that's, that's stuff that I'm rolling into also uh, doing a Yeti suit right now for my friend, Matt Patterson, who has uh, CCF is his company. Um, he will be at trans world this year. Uh, so he'll be, you know, he'll have all of his characters. It's a creative character fabrications, I believe is, is the name of his company and he'll have a booth there. He'll be selling, I think he's looking at about 70 characters is what he's doing, you know, creating for the show. Um, so there's, you know, uh, some projects going on and there's more, more stuff. I get calls all the time, people asking for certain things. And then, you know, sometimes, you know, they, it, we go back and forth and sometimes I don't, I don't <laughs> get a response. <laughs> it just depends. Um, I'm willing to work with anybody, you know, like different budgets I can work around. You know, I've done low budget. I've done bigger budget stuff. Awesome. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I never, I never discount anyone. And especially I came up in Indy, you know, um, and I, and I know how that world is. Uh, I've had, had direct, had to direct and write stuff before and, you know, so made some shorts and it's tough. That's a tough business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I feel for anybody that's trying to make a film, that is a massive undertaking and God it bless. is. Yeah. Yeah. Getting it in the can that, that like that yeah. we, we, we all would, no matter, I don't care what the quality of it is. And we, you know, cause I, I will, I'll admit on weekend horror, we've talked about some stinkers. But we always yeah. make sure credit where credit is due. Getting it in the fucking can, that right there yeah, is man. an achievement in of itself, man. Because you know, when you can say cut, print, let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> you know, oh, no, man, I man. respect it. I respect Big it. Time. Just getting it done is like, it's a, that's the life-changing experience. I mean, you know, it, it's monumental task. And, and it is like, it's like herding cats. It's like uh, mobilizing an army, you know, like all of those things. And you wear a lot of different hats. That even when you try not to, you end up wearing them. Um, yeah. So yeah, anyone that if filmmakers, I, I I love you guys and I respect you. And I you know I've done it myself. It's it's not an easy place to be. Uh, so you know I'm always willing to work with anybody. Is try you know figuring out budgets and all that kind of stuff. Um, awesome. Yeah. All right. Well. This has been absolutely amazing uh, to sit down and get an opportunity to talk. We don't, we don't, because because they're so busy, office so busy, we don't get an opportunity to talk with a lot of special effects uh, artists and the people who work in your in your particular field. But I'm so glad you made time in your busy schedule to come out and hang out with us. Uh, lots of awesome stuff in there, and I'm glad our audience got to hear it all. So thank you, Jesse, for hanging out with us. This has been an absolute blast. Thank you, ah, Jay. See, yeah, see what I did? <laughs> it has been a blast. Yeah. We're not on fire. So that's a good thing. There we um, go. Nice and safe. Uh, yeah, man. It's been great. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And if uh, you ever need uh, need anything else, let me know. Uh, we, we, we will keep in touch. We will. Awesome. Because we do, we, we do have, a, uh, we have a monster movie in the pipe. So we may, we may be chatting. So uh, for all of you audience members out there, you can check out uh, Jesse's work at jessielechalk.com. That's J-E-S-S-E-L-E-C-H-O-K.com. You will know you're at the right place because it's Dimension X Studios. You can see all the uh, examples of all the work, all the amazing work he's done. And of course, follow him on his IMDb link. So you can check out the stuff that he's got coming up, all the stuff that he has in pre-production, all of his old stuff that he's done. You can see all the examples of his work and check out his Etsy store at Dimension X Studios. It's Etsy.com slash shop slash Dimension X Studios. And you can actually get stuff yourself if you need stuff done. So go and check him out. He's got lots of stuff. You know, we all need the okay. work. It's a gig, it's a gig economy. There the we go. The goblins. And then little fish, little fish guys.
Oh, Everyone sweet. needs a little RPG. Okay, um, if I may say, the first one feels so much like Labyrinth, like something you yeah. see in Labyrinth, and then the second one feels very much like the Gilman from Monster Squad. Yeah, yeah, I'd say. I mean, uh, there's, there's a little few different influences. In Dif there. There's differences, but I see the influence there, which is awesome because Gilman, my favorite Universal monster, one hundred percent, always loved nice. it. The, I was captivated by the the shooting underwater. How did they get the camera underwater? How did they do this? It's amazing. The monster is there and he comes up. And plus, he wasn't the bad guy. Gilman was the good guy. They're the, yeah. the humans are the ones who are the bad guys. So I could go on. I could go on that too long. I love Gilman. But thank you again so very, very much for hanging out. And of course, uh, thank you, our amazing listeners, for making this one of the best horror podcasts on the absolute world. We love you so much. If you want to hear more of this, or if you want to get early access to the to stuff that we do here with the Front Row series, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash weekendhorror. You can support the channel, and you can hear all this cool stuff and hear all these cool stories and all this kind of stuff about the industry. You can get early access to that. We do this every single month. Every month we have a new guest that will come on and talk with us about why this industry, why this industry and why this genre is so amazing and how they make it amazing. So I want to thank you all so much out there. I have been JL. This has been Weekend Horror Front Row. We appreciate you hanging out with us. We will see you all next month. And as always, stay scared.